when I was younger, I played baseball. And um, at one point we were losing and I was in the dugout and I just start like, when in disgrace and fortune in men's eyes, <laughs> I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries. I look upon myself and curse my fate. My coach turns to me and is like, are you, are you doing Shakespeare in the dugout? What is wrong with you? <laughs> Night. I went to a Bay Flex show with uh, my partner. I'm jealous. Wait, uh, wait, was that in Birmingham? Alice Stevenson. That's the show you were at. Dude, that's awesome. It was so sick, dude. <laughs> that guy is nuts, man. He is so good. Does he still have uh, the same lineup? Like, I was about to say, because the only other person I know in the band is Victor Wooten, but right. yeah. Those, so that's the Flectones. And, yeah. and a lot of the Flectones, they've kind of splintered off to do their own thing. Um, this is really his, uh, his bluegrass mm -hmm. act. Um, there was an album that he put out called My Bluegrass Heart that they played a lot from. Um, and he did this show with the Punch Brothers. Nice. So Chris Thiele, mm -hmm. um, I don't know any of the other Punch Brothers, <laughs> but it, <laughs> uh, that's how a lot of those bands go. You're like, I know there's, there's like the one guy, but yeah. <laughs> um, but at one point it was, uh, like they just finished up this like blisteringly fast bluegrass thing and Bailiff likes this really like soft spoken guy. And he just kind of looks into the mic and is like, wow, that wasn't easy to play. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's chill things out a little bit. Three, four. <laughs> <laughs> like right back into it. No chill at all. They, uh, Bela Fleck is such an interesting um, musician to me because the, the crossover kind of appeal and not into like mainstream, but what I mean is there are like really jam, jam head type people, like people who love jam music who are mm -hmm. like, I love Bela Fleck. But then when I was in high school, I had a, a percussion director and a band director who were obsessed and they would, we would play, you know, a percussion ensemble version of, uh, I think one of them was Sinister Minister. We played, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. we played some of their songs and I remember just being like, well, eventually once I realized like, wait, 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 there's like hippies that love Bela Fleck, but then also my band director who was like really clean cut. Like it's, I guess my point is like, it's cool music that is considered kind of like very uh, esteemed in some mm. ways, but also you could see someone, you know, tripping on acid at the show and being like, I'm having a great time. You know, Everyone so. from like hippies to academics to truckers and like, like it, he, he can hit all of those notes. Um, but like my, my brother mentioned that there's like a viral triumvirate surging on us. And it was like COVID, flu and CSV. Oof. And I was like, I'll be fine. I don't need to wear a mask. And then we went and two days later, I was like, oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and it's and it's difficult to tell like what it is anymore. Um, but uh, uh, sorry, going back to what you said a second ago about like, you you know, the. Um, the crossover of like, it's like academics and hippies yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's kind of like the, uh, what I think maybe the subject of this podcast is a little bit that I wanted to bring up at least because my, uh, my like friendship with you and my like, anytime that we've kind of known each other, been around each other more, I've noticed that, that you're a person like that. And I kind of consider myself a little bit like this. And, and here's what I mean. We first met in, um, uh, or I mean, I guess first met. The first time I remember really like talking to you mm. was in um, a, a class we took in college that was a performance art studies class, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the first time I remember like uh, regularly seeing you and all that. And and I think uh, my point is, I noticed that about you, that you were a pretty like, you were, you know, good at academic writing or and you just generally were a well-read person. But, and, uh, and having conversations with you, I was like, you don't seem like the other musicians who I encounter who, especially at that time, maybe were a bit more, I don't know how to put it. It's like, it's not that you weren't alternative, but, but you were able to have like sophisticated conversations, but then also go into, you know, talking about, I don't know, uh, drinking beer and going to a show or something. It, it, I don't know how to put it exactly. Hood rat mode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, is that like a duality that you feel that you kind of, that you do feel like you've had over the years? Oh, for sure, man. I like, cause I, I grew up, my mom's an English teacher. Yeah. And so one of the first books that I read was Oliver Twist. I didn't really read it. I was like <laughs> six years old. I was just like, wow, pages turning. 
but it's my life has just kind of always been like that. I like when I was younger, I played baseball and um, at one point we were losing and I was in the dugout and I just start like when in disgrace and fortune in men's eyes, <laughs> I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries. I look upon myself and curse my fate. My coach turns to me and is like, are you, are you doing Shakespeare in the dugout? What is wrong with you? <laughs> I feel like there were some uh, some not PC words probably thrown at you. Oh, for the, sure. The for same sure. way that they were thrown at me over the years. You yeah, know? exactly. Because if you're into anything, I remember being into sports when I was younger, but then you also, once you start to discover, like, I'm kind of better at music or at art or things like that, you do kind of get a little bit of weird backlash from some of the people that you grew up with who were like, no, nah, man, you play football. And you're like, I, I'm i not really that good at football. I'm good at drums. Or, right. You know, or like, you know, I'm, I'm good at getting up on stage and being goofy and silly or like, you know, delivering things or performing. And I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm of a few minds of it. I think on the one hand, it intimidates people because they're like, I can't do that. And I maybe want to or like I, I see it as a form of because like especially nowadays we're into the point where cultural capital is power. Mm -hmm. And if you have a power that someone else doesn't have, then they like, I don't know, there's a weird negotiation that goes on there. And that's incredibly uppity. And like, I don't really see it that way. But if I'm being clinical, that's sort of, I think, maybe what's happening there is like as people like, because anybody can play sports, anybody can like have that ability, but it does kind of take a weird mind to be able to get up there and divorce yourself from yourself and perform. Well, and uh, that's honestly why not everyone is able to be like a head coach, because think yeah. about it, like head coaches a lot, even though we make we make fun of them because like a lot of their speeches after games are all the same. It's like, yeah, we, we went out there, we, our goal was to move the ball and we moved the ball. And we, and we, and our goal was to score points. We scored points. But but no, um, they but they are actors and they're per, or, or performers in some way, because like they're going out there and there's their goal is they're trying to make their fan base like you know rallied around and be like yeah like we 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 had a great game hell yeah we still mm -hmm, support us mm -hmm. or you know vice versa where it's like we had an awful game we here's what we need to do better but I don't know I guess I'm just saying like uh, that's why everyone ends up being a head coach because being in front of people and talking and trying to it, there's an art to it so there is yeah an art. and that's also too like there's a deep strategic mind that you have to have to be able to know a who your players are and who can do what and b how they work together socially because like i've been going to a lot of uh birmingham barons games mm -hmm. um and like <clears throat> it's funny to see like when you have the lineup of the guys there who are all like really tight with each other mm -hmm. and they play better yeah. And then you'll have somebody like trade in some people from other G League teams and they play like crap for a little while because they don't know who the other <laughs> players are. They don't have any rap with them. They can't actually hang and how that like contributes. And it's the exact same way with music, man. Like if you're playing with somebody you don't know, you're not going to be completely on fire. It is random. It is like a not that common to be in like a jam with a new person and then you're like, you know all of a sudden you're like, I mean, sometimes you can have that moment where you enjoy it, but I know what you're saying. And um, I was going to make a comparison. Oh yeah. To uh, Adam Sandler. He uses the same guys in all of his movies. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, he, because he, because I, I think he said in an interview a long time ago, he's like, well, if I'm gonna make all these movies, like I want to, um, I want to enjoy, you know, who I'm around. I don't want to like have to hire someone and get to know them on set and all that. He's like, I, I if I'm not mistaken, I think the guys that are in all of his movies, like Rob Schneider and all of them, uh, uh, several of them all went to NYU with him in like the eighties, nineties. So like that's, they, they were just like roommates and that's why he gets along with them so well. But I mean, and, and there's sometimes I get a little bit like, well, why don't you ever venture out and like, you know, hire other people. But there's something to be said for when you're spending 16 hours a day on a set, you want it to be, or if you're with musicians, if you're spending, you know, all this time touring with each other, you're mm. like, we want to actually enjoy the time or even practice. Practice can be, I've been in bands where if I didn't like, because I didn't necessarily love the people in the band, I was like, practice is kind of like excruciating or it's like, you know. Um, yeah. Or if you have like very different styles of, of working on things. Yeah. Like, I, I had a interesting 
uh, discussion with um, Seth uh, mm -hmm. of Bicycle Day recently where like he's also coming from a theatrical background and he made a very crucial distinction between practice and rehearsal. And so like there are people who come in and treat the rehearsal space where you're all working together as the time to learn the music. Oh, I <laughs> see what you're saying. Infuriating. <laughs> yeah. It's like, dude, come on. <laughs> like we don't have all the time in the world. We need to kind of be up and ready and like, I, I mean, it's the same with like a the, like a theatrical endeavor where like you have to know your lines before you get into blocking and staging because if you don't, you're gonna hold everything up. Yeah, it, it's gonna it's counterproductive. Like exactly. you don't get anything done. Exactly. Um, and actually, that's a compliment I'll pay you. Uh, that um, even like you getting here today for the podcast, uh, something I've, no I've always appreciated about you are people like you who have a theater background but also work in like commercial music settings mm. um uh musicians in my in my experience who just play music especially like rock music or you know anything that's a little more alternative they just kind of don't understand like uh why being late or canceling at the last minute or this or that why mm. it's like a big deal but someone with a theater background like you you understand that you're like no if i said i'm gonna be there i need to be there and if i like if we're if we have a show on saturday we have to rehearse this many times before that because I've been in bands before where people just treat it like, well, pff, we can play a couple times like before and w and we'll have it. And I'm like, no, that's that's <laughs> not that because because in theater, at least good theater, you prat you rehearse so much until it's muscle memory and it's like you're it's second nature. You're not even having to worry about it, and that's how a band should be or any artistic endeavor. But I've just encountered creative people who they're more creative in like a, I don't know how to put it. They're not organized. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's there's a sort of ability that some people have to just sort of go so with the flow that they lose track of the direction. There you go, yeah. And, and like, it's, it's, it's important to be able to go with the flow. It's, you know, it's it's good to know how to kind of move with the, the path of least resistance. Be like water. Be like water, but at the same time, water is directed. Water takes yeah, the shape true. of its form. And, and that's crucial. If it doesn't, then it becomes a problem. It like breaks riverbanks and floods. This is and true, like, I didn't think know. of it that way. I mean, I'm all the time thinking about water. I'm a Pisces. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, goodness. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, shit, where was I going to go with that? I'm trying to think. Trying I know to... what you mean, though. I We've been trying to uh, get a show in uh, Birmingham with, like, a few different bands who are all good people. They make great music, and, like, they're, they're really, really fun to, like, go see and hang out with. Mm -hmm. But they've been pulling this shit on us where, like, they say, yeah, we're good. We're booked for December 15th. We'll be there absolutely two weeks before. They're like, hey, sorry, we've had something come up. We can't do that show. Yeah. And then two days later, they post a bill where they're playing a bigger venue or they're playing with a different <sighs> band. And we're like, you rat bastards. <laughs> Alex, what would you do if I told you I've had that happen with this podcast? <laughs> I would, I would. Oh, oh it, it's it's such a bad feeling when you literally have someone. I've had people literally like 15 minutes before they're supposed to be here. Be like, hey, uh, my mom's in town. Sorry, I can't do it. And then I see them on some podcast where it's, I'm like, oh, cool. You got like 800 views on that video instead of like the hundred you might get on mine. But it's still just like it's still frustrating because you're like. I know how the game works, yep. but I wish you'd be honest. Cause yeah. like, because because that's the thing, I, I, I'm a big boy, I can take it, but when you lie, and then, you know, I, I've even those same people I've like hit up later and been like, well, you said uh, you were just busy that day. Do you still want to do it? And they're like, never respond. And I'm, and I'm like, I'm kind of doing this for you in a way, because like, we're going to talk about your music sure. the whole time, not me. I mean, so anyway, it's a, that's a, you know, a burn that no one will ever, the people I'm talking about will never see it because they sure. don't give a shit, but yeah. it's, they'll, they'll it's never whatever. watch it. Like it's yeah. But no, no, I mean, but I, I know what you mean though. It, it is really frustrating when you try to make plans of people. Whereas like, if you, if you have like a theater background, you know how many times I was in a play and there was some great concert or party or thing going on that I was like, oh man. And sometimes I'm, I wasn't even in a play. I was like, you know, running spotlight number two where mm. I barely did anything. And then, yeah. And then to have to be like, sorry, I can't go to this awesome concert. That's like a, you know, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yep. I have to run this spotlight for into the woods. And I'm like, 
No, for real. So many opportunities like that were missed for college theater. And I think it's just, you know, um, it, it, when you make a commitment, you need to commit to it. So. For sure. There, there's literally a shirt I've seen that says, I can't, I have rehearsal. And it's a very popular shirt. I've yeah. seen that a bunch, yeah. And like, you know, if 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 you can be kind of, uh, I don't know, a little fluffy about it, it's a sacred space. It's like, this is where art happens. This is something that we have to take seriously and that we have to protect yeah. and value. And I, I, I view it that way. I felt really bad because I, I was at band practice last night and I was like, hey guys, sorry, we've had a change up with our schedule at work because some people got sick and I got to close now. Can we kick it to like 7.30? I'm really, really sorry. Mm -hmm. And they were like, yeah, that's, that's no problem. It's yeah, like I'm off all week. It's Christmas week, man. Like we're just hanging out. And I'm like, okay, good. Thank goodness. Wow. Okay, gosh. And I'm like winding myself up into a lather over it. And they're like, no, yeah, whatever, we're just, I'm, I'm off, dude. <laughs> it is weird too, yeah, because like some people really, really care and some people, you know, don't. And I don't think, what's weird is it's not always uh, proportional with like how successful someone's going to be. Mm. Because it, it, I feel like being an organized, very motivated, like art, artistic kind of person, it is frustrating to see, sometimes you see like a band or um, someone like, have more success than you and you mm. know that they like don't practice as much as you or they don't sure. like put as much effort or this or that into it and you're like but you know obviously it's just part of the part of how things go so it's, it's not like when i was when i was playing with nate and we were doing all those bobby rock and roll shows mm -hmm. and we were right there next to lady legs yeah and i love the lady legs boys man i still listen to their music all the time <clears throat> and like we saw how far they were jumping and it's like we were we were right there next to them for just a little while and then they just jumped right off and yeah there's there's a way that that can turn really bitter and be like a negative thing but like i was happy for my friends man i never i never felt that way but i, I totally see what you mean where it's like there's not necessarily a rhyme or reason to it it's just kind of what happens happens yeah and like that that's what makes i think being a creative so freaking hard is because you have to be this type a very organized very precise very prompt person who can also just be chaotic and yeah. accept that the life that you lead is not gonna lead where you think it will especially uh i think in a lot of music and i noticed this about you uh that you're you're pretty adept at um improvising at like jamming with people not not all musicians are made for that but uh, but like when you're a musician who uh that's also an interesting duality is like music that you're able to be more free form with and mm -hmm. play around with is different from you know music where uh the the person's like i want you to play exactly this don't go off of it because because yep. i've been in bands where the as the drummer that has been very prescriptive. They're like, don't play any more notes than what we have here. Like exactly as it's on the recording. Um, and then I've been in bands where they're like, you know, I want it to be different every time. So it's just, mm -hmm. it. Uh, what do you prefer? Man, I don't know. I'm, I'm playing with this guy right now named Brother Josh. And like, he does this thing that I love to see where he's primarily a, a guitarist and a songwriter and he writes out his lines and he'll show them to me and be like this is kind of the shape that i want it to have but like also do do you do mm -hmm. do you on top of it and i i think i really really like that where it's like <clears throat> he has a trajectory for the song he has something melodically that he already has in mind but he knows that i'm gonna fill it and mm -hmm. that i'm gonna embellish it so that what he has will be there but also it'll be fleshed out a lot yeah i really like that because he's very flexible and very like not afraid to be like hey that's a bit busy roll it back a little yeah. bit or but then at the same time like this other band that i'm with like seth never plays anything the same way twice and it's funny because now we have recordings. Now we have material that we've released that people are going to expect to sound yeah. a certain way. And we don't always play it like that. And I, I, on the one hand, that really fulfills me as a creator because it's like I can just do what I want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um I, yeah, I, long, long answer short. I don't really know, man. I'm, well, I'm well and it's like, it's a weird question because like the, the, you might, you might prefer something different at different times. Yeah. Personally, I have not really ever enjoyed being in a band as a drummer when someone's like, you know, they don't leave it open at all. And yeah. they're like, just play like this, especially if what they want me to play is very straightforward. 
Yeah, because I'm kind of like, well, no offense, but I don't consider myself like a Ringo type. Sure. Where Ringo was very good at like coming up with a simple rhythm and that like it was kind of iconic for every song. He had like some kind of thing that he did that was like, but I'm like, that's just not really me as much. I don't know. I, I'm very much so into changing things up and playing different, you know, embellishing. Sort yeah. Of like, yeah. because there's always, I, I think it's funny because people can try and restrict, but there will always be the room for it. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, there is a lot of validity to this, like this notion that restrictions enhance creativity because it's like you you have to sort of fill a space that they're seeing but i have frequently found myself in like a musical space where i'm like i see a lot more mm -hmm. around what can happen here than what you're expecting yeah so i i see what you mean it doesn't always mean playing like uh, playing a bunch of notes like, no yeah that's what i had to learn over time is that it's like just because there's space there doesn't mean you just put extra notes in there i'm not like a drummer that's going to be like you know it's it's usually usually like i actually really prefer like a simple drum set like mm. like for years when i was in college i used just bass drum yep. snare drum hi-hat and I think I maybe use like a ride as like a crash ride or something yeah. like that. But, uh, be, and, and there's some great, uh, um, it, you and I have always gotten along on, um, funk music. Oh yeah. And I'm trying to remember, uh, is it, are they called the fearless flyers? The, the Nate Smith. I think so. Yeah. I mean, but he, he has a really simple drum setup really like that for that one. Yeah. And it, and he, he makes it sound like it's so much more than what it is. No, I remember here's a good re reminiscing. Um, yeah. You and I, like I said, uh, you know, we'll kind of give a little origin a little bit. We'll talk yeah. about this some. We met um, at Auburn, but I remember when I, one of the first conversations I had with you, I talked to you and was like, you know, because you told me you went to Auburn High, mm -hmm. and, I, and I was like, oh, uh, I think I remember you, like, uh, offhandedly from Trumbauer, yeah. but I never, because we both did theater in high school, but I never, like, talked to you. I just remember seeing, wait, did you wear a hat? In like theater, did you wear like a? Did you wear wait a beret or like a fedora? A fedora. No. There we go. It was you. No. <laughs> so yeah, dude. Um, no, but you know, here's the thing. All theater kids can, uh, can be a little judgmental of other theater kids. We're all they're they're all uh, cringy, and so oh, yeah. th that's the funny thing. Is I probably saw you and was like, "Who's this kid think he is in this fedora?" But then there I was wearing some. I don't know what I wore back then, but like I definitely. I mean, I had braces. What am I thinking? <laughs> I had braces and was trying to do Oedipus Rex monologues. So like, w w who's more cringy? I don't know. But I don't know. Me in a fedora. That's mm. oh, oh no. Uh, and if I remember correctly, it was a fedora that had um, like a red, yellow. And green stripe on it, which is like the the flag of Jamaica. I was gonna say like a Rasta kind of thing. Yeah, that's funny. Um, what have you done? <laughs> what kind of uh, what, what kind of like theater did you do back then? More like did you? Because like I really back then I loved like really intense epic like monologues that I would do for those for Trumbauer. But oh, yeah. now I look back and I'm like I hate that kind of acting in theater. I don't want to ever do that. But well, I mean, because it's just like there's not really anything now that that can really. I don't know. There, there are like very serious plays and stuff that are being produced, but it's always going to be like niche stuff. I think the era of like intense drama that are in the popular eye have shifted to films and yeah. TV shows and stuff True. like that. Like any any kind of drama play is just not really going to hit the same. I mean, for Trombauer and stuff like that, man, I was always doing musical stuff mm -hmm. because I'm I was a dude who could sing. And so, oh, okay, I didn't think about that. Yeah. yeah, everybody needed a partner for their duet or like, you know, it, it was kind of, I think that's another reason why I sort of gravitated toward theater circles is because like, you always need dudes in a theater scene. Especially in high school, because, like they would school. always be going to like the football team, being like, "Is any of these guys not really that good at football? Because we can definitely take them." <laughs> yeah, is, there, is there a place for me? I remember it was a good friend of mine, Ben Strickland, who is actually I, th I think still working in theater in Atlanta right now, and he played football. I want to say for like two weeks. <laughs> got his shit wrecked on field one day and was just like, I hate this. <laughs> I'm He's leaving. like, I'm too good looking to do football. I'm like going <laughs> back to theater. I'm going to, I'm going to play trombone and marching band and I'm going to have fun. I'm not going to have burly high schoolers deck me to the ground. <laughs> I haven't spoken to him in a few years, but that's like a fun memory that I mean, I've talked to him about before that me and him have the same first and last name. Have I talked to you about this before? My my first name is technically Benjamin. Really? So but so in my you know my last name is Strickland. So check this out. This is pretty funny related to Trumbauer and all that. So 
Trumbauer, my senior year, um, I had, like I said, a monologue from Oedipus Rex that I was pretty proud of. It's like the one where he's talking to, it's, it's the ironic one near the beginning where he's talking to the Phoebians being like, hey, uh, does anybody know who uh, killed, I think it's Laius, yeah. and, and then, which is actually Oedipus's father. And he's just basically being like, if nobody tells me who killed Laius, we're gonna have some problems around here and no one's talking. And he's just like, really? No one's like, no one's gonna come forward? Like you're gonna ruin, you know, society and everything. And like, we're all gonna collapse. Like we have a famine going on and it's him the whole time. <laughs> he killed his own father, so he doesn't know it. So anyway, it's a, it's a funny yet tragic yet epic monologue. I was doing that and uh, I was really proud of it. And when we got to state Trumbauer, I performed it. And um, whenever it was time for awards, uh, they were like, uh, you know, and in the category I was in, it was like third place, Benjamin Strickland. And I was freaking out because I was like, I never qualified or anything. I never like got an award. And I was like, yeah. So I stood up and I started walking. And then my theater director was like, no, 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 no. That, wrong, wrong no, no no there's another guy and but the weird part to me was it, it wouldn't have been as weird to me if they were from somewhere else like Birmingham or Mobile or something but he's from Auburn. Auburn and I was like so wait there's a guy with my exact first and last name who goes to the school like right and Ben was a year younger yeah. than me so it it, it was you know I, I'm uh, not trying to be like a tragic little boy sure. over here but I remember at the time being like this sucks. And it what? was, and it was for third place. It wasn't like it was, you know, <laughs> I, I shouldn't have been that excited, but I was, you know, but. that's just such a weird nexus of just like, yeah, <laughs> I know, man. <laughs> I mean, I've told that story a few times over the years. Whenever I started going to uh, Auburn and was in the theater department, mm. I met Ben and I told him that story. Uh, and I remember him being like, Oh, Okay, no way. I mean, I don't, I don't think he really had much of a reaction, yeah. but I was like, well, it meant more to me because <laughs> in, in the moment, you're probably like, well, I still got an award, but I was like, well, I got, you know. Uh, well, this happened to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he's like, cool, bye. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He wasn't like rude or anything. It's just funny. But um, yeah, um, good times thinking back on that. And it's weird though, because um, actually let's talk about this kind of transition. Mm. Um, you did some theater work this past summer that was kind of like a, a mixture of your musician work and your theater work, right? I did, yeah. I was in a uh, production of the Glenn Hansard musical once. And it's kind of funny because I, you know, when I graduated from Auburn in 2017, I sort of put theater down for a little while. Um, I had had just some social issues that made me think everyone who works in theater is gonna be this toxic, conniving person that I just do not want anything to do with. It's always gonna be this intense, high stress environment where I am just never enough. Mm -hmm. Like, cause you know, the audition process is incredibly stressful. It's like you enter this cycle of self judgment and I like was having a really hard time getting out of that. And I was just like, I'm into music now. I wanna focus on that. Bye bye theater. Like it has informed me and like one of the things was that performance theory seminar where I suddenly realized, oh my Lord, all the world's a stage. Everything we do is a performance. And I started to kind of integrate that into my musical performance and I started feeling really fulfilled there. And then slowly but surely I had kind of started to, to just let that kind of patter down and I, I didn't really realize how much I missed that kind of full brain, full body engagement. And this, uh, the fiance of uh, Brother Josh, the guy I mentioned earlier, um, worked for Red Mountain Theater. Mm -hmm. And I was over there one night, I was hanging out with him, and she just happens to mention, hey, this theater that I'm working for is looking for a bassist for this production of Once. And I was familiar with Once, I had actually done um, Leave for a, a vocal repertory class. And I was like, okay, sure. I'll audition and <clears throat> in my mind, I was gonna be in the pit. I was gonna be yeah. in their orchestra because she led with they're looking for a bassist. I did not know the the real, I don't know, the, the real sort of nature of that stage show because the stage show is very different from the film. Mm -hmm. The film is very much an, an artifact of its time and a, a sort of brainchild of Glenn Hansard and like, Oh, I've forgotten his co-star's name. Oh gosh, um, I'll think of it later. You can you can Google it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the stage show is very different, and it's a lot more lively. And as I'm doing the audition, first off, I realized that it was an audition, and I was like, "Wait a second, uh, I'm auditioning. This is for 
once. And then they called me later and were like, hey, uh, your cast, like rehearsal start in two weeks. And I was like, I'm what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and then turns out, yeah, the band is on stage. The band is the cast. I love that, yeah. And it, it makes it a dash difficult show to cast because you have to find someone, A, who can play cello and act and dance with the cello on them. And we found someone and like, shout out to the Once Fam, man. I, I love those people. It it turned into just this incredibly edifying experience mm -hmm. where you could be vulnerable and competent and still have this ethos of creativity. And like our, our director, Roy Leitner, was just so good at giving us the space but funneling us towards the end goal. Mm -hmm. And it it reignited me in a really, really meaningful way. And I like I remember there was one day during rehearsal where I was just weeping because it was coming together. And I look over and like my friend Olivia is also tearing up. And like our our lead, uh, Matt, is also like struggling to say his lines because he's been in this show before. Mm -hmm. He knows what's going on. And this production is still so affecting and so like our chemistry was so immaculate that it was just knocking him to the floor. And like, I I was just like, man, this is this is it. This is all of the good parts of theater that I experienced in college with none of the toxic social problems. I know what you mean. Well, I think that that's, I think part of the problem of college theater is that, I, well, I think it's really healthy if for anybody, whether you're on like a football team or mm. in theater or any any like major or group where you're gonna have to spend a lot of time with people, don't like date within that God, group. It, God, it, it, no. If you are, it, like do it like with someone who's kind of adjacent, someone who's like a theater minor or, yeah. you know, it, it, it's really, no, just not good for you in the long run and and like I uh, I kind of you know learned that at certain points in college just just like or or not even just dating um don't you know I guess you have to be really careful about like careful. what you say and who you you know uh I don't know like exactly what I'm saying I, I think it's just like being in that like that close of a group of people for four years together you know the people that are in your in your grade or anything it, it's a it's a lot by the end of it you have a lot of like things that you don't like about each other because you've really gotten to know each other too for well sure. and you've taken all these classes where you got really intimate with each other so for sure n not in a weird way but like literally <laughs> sharing your trauma and sharing like you know things that uh scare you or things that you know like you're you're trying to and and that stuff is meant to it <sighs> I don't know. So it actually begs the question of like, would it be better if we did those kind of exercises more individualistic instead of like in a group of people? I don't think you could. Yeah, actually, I, a good I, point. I, I think part of the difficulty is learning to navigate those waters when you're still effectively a high schooler. Yeah. Like you're still effectively just a teenager who can drink now. <laughs> yeah. And like for some people, I think it, it becomes this very competitive space where like you have to always be on. And if you're not yeah. on, you have no value and you just need to get out. I've heard, I make a lot of references to this in this podcast, but it's just because uh, I'm, I watch a lot of comedy podcasts. Sure. So I, I hear a lot about comedy, but I hear comedians talk about that where like, or even people, comedy fans will, will comment on like comedy uh, podcasts and they'll be like, oh, I love this one guest because when they're on this podcast, they're not, Tr always put up being on and trying to make everyone laugh. They're just chilling and they happen to be funny because they're like just being themselves as opposed to like, and, and I think, and, and I've heard them talk about it too with like, you know, if they're backstage at like a comedy show, there are the people who think they have to make everyone in the green room laugh when it's right. like, just be yourself, you know? And th that happened a lot for me in college where you do, I think when I was really, when I was younger, it meant more to me. And by the time, when I went to Auburn, it was my second school that I'd been to. And like, um, uh, cause I went, I went to university of Montevallo for a little while, but, oh, okay. but, uh, basically when I, by the time I got to Auburn, I was a little more mature and uh, because I was literally like 23 when I went to Auburn. Actually, it was the weird thing because I was a transfer student and I had enough credits to where I was technically like on the cusp of like junior, senior, not really sure. And, uh, but because I was new, um, my first day at Auburn, I had people who were like 19 
uh, oh, who were like right. sophomores coming up to me and being like, "Hey, are you are you new?" And I was just like, "I'm like 23." Like, I, I, <laughs> and and I'm also from Opelika, so right. like you know it was it was different. And I understand why they were they were trying to be friendly, but it was it was really weird being a transfer student and being like well past old enough to drink because I would have to take things like alcohol edu, and I was like, "Oh, like what?" Because that thing's designed for like 19 year olds. Yeah, you don't know how to drink, but right. you know. Anyway. And it just made you want to go get a beer. Yeah, really. Well, because one of the exercises they did in Alcohol EDU is they literally... Did you ever have to take that? No, what the hell is so, this? So, so it was the thing that Auburn made me do where it was literally like an online class where for the most part, you could just hit skip, skip, skip and get through. It was like a bunch of modules. But one of the things they had you do was they were trying to drive home the fact of like, hey guys, liquor is is stronger than than wine and <laughs> wine is stronger than beer. So what they had you do was, you, you know, so, so they're trying to drive home the idea of like, if you drink like an ounce and a half of liquor, it's the same amount of alcohol as five ounces of wine, oh. which is the same amount of alcohol as 12 ounces of like a normal beer. So what they had you do was they had a cartoon thing on the module. There was like a glass, a glass, a wine glass. And it's just like, click on the bottle of wine to pour the wine into the glass. And like pretty much it was trying to say like, sh stop it at the right spot where five ounces of wine is. Because they were trying to have you illustrate for them that you know where five ounces of wine is so that you, and I think the whole point is that they're like, well, a lot of alcohol poisoning happens because Portion people, control. yeah, they don't understand like, oh, well, drinking five ounces of liquor is way more than five ounces of beer. But I'm like, everyone knows that you can taste it. But yeah, it was the dumbest thing because I was like, just having to literally click and be like, shh, shh, you know, and it was pouring wine or pouring <laughs> beer into a, like a solo cup. And yeah, it felt really silly. But anyway, that's. Being a transfer student was weird in that way because here was part of my problem. A theater department, you you make a lot of your friends when you're like a freshman or sophomore, you know, right. like that's kind of like who you end up with. I was I was having to take some freshman level classes, couldn't really relate to the 18 year olds because I was just like, well, I don't do any of the same things that y'all do because they all lived in like a dorm and they, you know, and I was just mm -hmm. like, and I couldn't, it's hard to be friends with them because they were so much younger than me, but I had classes with them. But I couldn't really be classes with the people who were like juniors and seniors because I was like, they already had their friends. Right. But then the people who were actually my age were like the alums that would come by every now and then. And I felt really disconnected from them. So I would, in general, I was like, it kind of sucks being like a theater transfer student because a lot that. of people already kind of had their friends. But yeah, I mean, I sort of had something similar because a lot of the people in the theater department at Auburn went to Auburn High School. I said yeah. a lot, a few of them. And so more, I- More than most high schools. Sure. I mean, I, I noticed that too, yeah. And like, I was friends with them, but I sort of started to see them like pulling away from those relationships and trying to like diversify and like meet new people. And in doing that, just kind of pushed other relationships aside and like, I took that really personally and it kind of hurt because it was like, oh, but like we were really good friends in high school. Why aren't we hanging out anymore? Why do you seem to hate me? And it's like, you don't hate me. Yeah. You're just growing up and you're like wanting to, to seek other things. And like a lot of those people too are now completely gone and like are off in Atlanta or like in New York and doing doing their own thing and like living their own lives. And I was I was too young, I think, to sort of understand that that isn't personal. That wasn't personal to me. Yeah. And that's, that's just kind of a, again, that's a hard thing to negotiate when you're effectively a teenager who can drink. <laughs> what was your actual major in college? I can't remember. So I was an English major. That's what I thought. I, yeah. I majored in creative writing um, and I was going to get a theater major. Like there at the end, I had the credit hours. I had basically everything lined up but I had already been there for five years and the way that they structured their classes, I wasn't gonna be able to take the core classes that I had to until the next fall. So that would have been another two years of my life, yeah. another countless thousands of dollars that I did not have. Yeah. And so I said to butts with it, I'll just take the minor. And the ironic thing is a bulk of my credit hours came from shows and theater classes. Mm. So like I had all of my, I had all of the, the training and in, in like, you know, writing and sort of critical analysis and things like that. But then my, my actual, I don't know what's the term they use in pedagogy the the like investment of my education time was in how to be an actor <laughs> yeah so it was this weird sort of unfocused hazy education that 
has ultimately served me very well. I'm not complaining. I think everyone would benefit from a liberal arts education because it just taught me how to think. And it, yes. and it taught me how to smell bullshit from a mile away. And that's incredibly handy. <laughs> it's handy, but it's a little crippling for me that, uh, you know, I knew this before taking classes like uh, the performance theory class, but once you take any class about like design or I remember the first like class I took when I was like a sophomore, you know, probably like 2013 or something in theater design. And after I, after I took that class, I was like, I can't watch a movie or a play without thinking constantly about color or yep. uh, shapes or, you know, just the meaning behind everything. Yeah. How awesome would it be? Like ignorance really is bliss because how think about how cool it would be to be able to go back to the era of just being like, I'm just watching this movie and enjoying it. Instead of literally in some of the classes I took in college, we were watching scenes from like Sleeping Beauty and going, ah, so yeah, the you see like the opening that Maleficent came out of, very vaginal. What does that mean? You know, and, 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 and no, and for real, and, but then it's like, but she comes out and she has a scepter. That's a phallic symbol. And I'm just like, stop it. You're ruining these movies that I once thought were kind of like, just, you know, I guess uh, uh, innocuous. They don't have yeah. anything to them and they do have so much to them. It's like, I can't even really read anything anymore because I get either hung up on the prose and think like, this is really clumsy. I don't really care for this. When it's like, dude, it's, this is baseline exposition. They're not putting time into this because it doesn't matter. Why are you hanging up on this? And then suddenly I'm like, okay, but who is writing this? Why do I care about what they have to say? Yeah, like, yeah. I, I just can't, we just can't have fun. <laughs> just... I mean, yeah, and it also, I think, well, I mean, a big part of, you know, we talked in, in those kind of classes, I think even in like theater mm. uh, one or two or yeah, something yeah. At, at Auburn about uh, Marxism. And that's something that you really can't like, once you, once any like 18 year old is like, wait, 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 wait. So like, it's all just, uh, I don't know. It, it, once they start to see more of the structure of like society's finances, you just kind of go, well, this kind of ruins everything, you know, or it, like we're all doing this because of this artificial construct. It's like, if we wanted to, none of us really had to work ever again, wait. you know, I, <laughs> I, I mean, but, but it, it was kind of crazy watching some students that I took those classes with. Cause I was like 23 and they were like 18 and they were like, they really had those realizations for the first time because, well, I mean, when you're in high school, for the most part, you don't like, you don't have to think about that stuff because your parents, they pay for everything. And so that, I mean, for a lot of people at least, and then once you get to college, it's the first time you're ever having to like budget things for yourself mm -hmm. or work for yourself. Work and for you're yourself, like, yeah. this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Especially if you're in a situation where you're like, actually producing things yeah. like i you know i think about people that i went to college with who were like working in um <clears throat> like even just like food service where it's like you're making other people's food that they then eat and completely disregard you yeah and like that's really humbling because it's like i don't matter to you but i am keeping you alive <laughs> and like that that negotiation is a really really funny one to see teenagers who can drink go through because mm -hmm. it's like suddenly you go from this place of like i am the center of my universe to i am a face in the crowd yeah and, and it, it is a little disheartening um yeah. be well because i mean Especially, uh, I don't mean to be one of these people. And like, I, I grew up, you know, middle class, maybe, I, I guess you could say that my dad made upper middle class money, but I have seven siblings. So we were basically lower middle class. Just or drained so, it out somewhere of him. in the, we, we definitely fell because yeah. of all the kids. But, <laughs> but uh, so it's, it's one of those things where I try not to talk from, because I'm like, I definitely come from a place of privilege, but it's right. like, a different kind of privilege than some people had and in and, and no way am I the victim, but I'm like, I'm like, I don't think it's exactly the same as a kid that grew up, you know, uh, as an only child or like with one mm. sibling with the same amount of money. But anyway, um, why did I say all that? Um, at Auburn, um, you see a lot of uh, money that it part of me is like even oh, yeah. kind of like, where does this come from? Like, because and I know some of it's from out of state. Some of it's like people who their parents just like have a huge house in Hoover and they send their kids down here. But like there's times when you like interact with people and you're just kind of like it, that really opens your eyes because your college experience is not going to be like, I had a better college experience than some people who had to work for everything. Right. But also, you know, I, I still had to work and still had to like, you know, and that kind of thing. There's people who like when I drive by some of the houses in Auburn, I'm like, 
a student lives there. Like I, I can tell it's like, this is not, and I'm like, that's a nicer house than I will ever live in as an adult and, you know, or own. But, um, and they just don't even think about it. They're just like, oh yeah, that's my house. It's like dog that has more value, especially now that I have like my real estate license and everything. I start looking at things like that, where it's like, that is an asset <laughs> that will whoa <laughs> that's good for your whole family for generations, generations. like yeah so so i guess my point of bringing that up is it's like you don't really see that quite as much when you're um when you're like in high school you don't realize that like oh i live in like a really nice neighborhood or something and then once you get to college and you have to start like you know uh, paying your own rent or even if you don't go to college like you just start to really see like how some of the other half lives and you go oh so like we're not all the same we didn't nope. all you know nope like some people don't live like us pete yeah some, yeah <laughs> like, well i mean hey you know i live comfortably for what i have but uh but it, it is one of those things where you're kind of like like auburn as an institution um but I think the president makes at least a million dollars a year from what I understand. Easy. And, uh, and they, my dad works for Robert and they have a hard time even like giving him, you know, like a $2,000 raise or something. And you're like, Oh, you mean, so he can make like 65 instead of 63. Like, you know, and, and yeah. you're just like, it, it's one of those things where you're like, you know, $65,000. I, I, I'm, I'm throwing numbers out there that sure, aren't real, sure, sure. but I'm saying, you know, they, they pay people well enough to live, but you're like, but some of y'all are making like, Two, three hundred thousand dollars, and you don't even teach any classes. You're suddenly, just the head of a department. Or... Suddenly, the word "head coach" is mentioned, and everybody's eyes kind of go, "Oh." Um, mm. You know what? This is something I, me and me and Hudson, a couple episodes ago, I talked a lot of. We, I mean, we talked a little bit of shit, but it's okay. Sure. I, no one really listens to this. But <laughs> no, I mean, hey, I, I think it's a funny joke to make. But uh, but what I was gonna say was one of the things that bothered me since we're talking about theater in hindsight is. I feel like if you're like a theater professor at like a, you know, pretty big university like Auburn, like I feel like there was really all I got from them was what to do or how to run things in theater in like idealistic scenarios where mm -hmm. there's plenty of money and all that. Cause I'm sure. like Auburn, it's easy for those professors to get a little bit like blinded by the fact that they're like, well, we just get this money from Auburn to do productions. When I went to Montevallo, we had so little money in the theater department. We were literally like reusing nails and screws, which is so unsafe, but it's like, that's the kind of thing they had to do to, to make set. We, we reuse set pieces all the time. And, um, I think my point is like some of the people that, you know, teach in like that theater department make like over a hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. And you're kind of like, I don't think that it, you guys are not necessarily because of your financial situation, you're not really in the best position to be teaching us about how to practically go out there and be a working professional in theater. Yeah. And, and that's not me just trying to be a, a little, you know, asshole. It's just me trying to say, I know I see a lot more now as like a working adult that money and your background and where you came from, it means so much. Oh, for sure. And I mean, like, even if you're attached to an institution, like with the, with the production at Red Mountain Theater, they are a very fortunate, very well-connected theater in Birmingham. They do a lot of education in the community. And so they have a lot of, like, profit flows and stuff. And, like, at one point, like, somebody needed an instrument. And the next day, that instrument was there. Mm -hmm. And it it just worked out. And I I could see the privilege and the fortune that I had had to be a part of that institution. And like <clears throat> also to hear stories like, again, our, our front man, Matt had been working in uh, New York theater for a while and would talk about like productions that he had done where like they were bringing their own instruments and like some people were like donating money for like the plywood for the sets yeah. and stuff like that. And it's like, there is a, there's a disconnect that can absolutely happen when you're attached to an institution and doing education. Everything can kind of start to seem idealized and like everything's just going to work out for you when it's like, no, that's half of the struggle when you're doing a production is figuring out how to work with what you have. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're absolutely right, man. Absolutely. I've had people be like over the years, over the past, uh, I've had some people, including my lovely wife, uh, over the years be like, well, no shit, it's not, you're not going to be able to, but I'm like, I wasn't trying to be, I wasn't trying to make a lot of money in theater, but the way it was like sold to me in college was very much so like, oh, well, get an internship mm -hmm. that'll get your foot in the door. And then this, 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 and what they don't tell you though. And I think this is like a whole point of talking about money and all this. 
what they didn't, what they never talked about was, oh, hey, uh, these internships, like, even after you have that, you probably won't get paid to be on stage as a theater actor for a few years. Like, right. and if you do get paid, it's like gas money pretty much. Yep. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, on top of that, you know, you have to make ends meet. You have to live, you have to work a 40 hour week job just to like pay your rent. So I think th that was the hard part was the trying to juggle everything because like the only jobs really that work really well with like trying to be an actor are uh, like restaurant jobs. Cause you can leave a restaurant job if you don't, if you have a, a, a more important thing to, to go do right. and you don't care about it. And it's just like they, oftentimes those shifts are at night when, you know, and I don't know. It's just, it's weird to me that in college they didn't do a better job of being like, let's kind of talk about the practicality and some like <laughs> jobs that you can have. Yeah. You know, I mean, you got your realty license. I, I did. And like, I was going to say, that's actually something that really worked out for me when I was in once because I was doing some apartment leasing for a company called Rent Monster. And like, they are a really, really cool company where basically like I worked when I wanted and like, <clears throat> as long as I was pulling in clients and doing my prospecting, they didn't care. They yeah. were, they came and saw me in the show. Nice. Like yeah, man, they were, they were good people and like, were very accommodating of like what I was trying to do. But I think there is a really meaningful overlap between the service industry and theater or even just performance in general, where like. It's like I, I, I joke sometimes where like, oh, I'm wearing black jeans and vans. Am I a musician or am I a bartender? Yeah. <laughs> and that the fact that I can make that joke points to something where it's like the the people and it, it sort of harkens back to something I said earlier, where like cultural capital is power. Sure. But you have to know how to use that to your advantage in society in this capitalistic hellscape we all share and like if you aren't educated in the ways of doing that then how are you going to know you're yeah. going to you're going to hit the real world you're going to hit atlanta and realize that they're paying you 150 bucks a week to do this show that absolutely sets you on fire, but your rent is $800 a month minimum. You have $500 worth of insurance. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and actually that was the craziest thing is just like literally car insurance by itself was like three times as much when I lived in Atlanta. Yeah. Just, just because- You lived in Atlanta. Yeah, and Rex are more. <laughs> and that city, I love, I, I love Atlanta, but it's getting, it's it's pretty much getting unlivable for uh, someone of lower income. I mean, because I just got lucky and found a few places that were affordable. But as I was leaving, if I had stayed, I mean, it would have just been too too much money. And 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 a place like that is only really profitable to you if you're going out constantly and enjoying the things it has to offer. Right. I I'm, I'm kind of a homebody these days, so it's sure. like we, living in Atlanta didn't make a lot of sense to you know, but um. No, I was going to talk about for a second. Um, I, I kind of related to what you're talking about with being on stage as a musician mm. in a theater play and once, because the only thing I really did theater wise in Atlanta was I played drums in a production of Hedwig right. and Hedwig is, it's, it's weird to me that it's not known by more people in popular culture because like it's still kind of considered an alternative musical and all that. But if more people like were to have that theater experience, they might go theater's really cool because yeah. I mean, but uh, there are productions of Hedwig that are a bit more like Broadway y. Um, and the one I was in was pretty, I thought we did a pretty good job of being like pretty alternative, pretty true to its roots. Mm -hmm. But um, um, I love the idea of, I've played in a pit before and it's not that much fun. Like you're kind of, but when you're on the stage and you, like, my, I had a character name and everything. Yeah. Um, did hey. your, was that kind of the same? Yeah. MC. Nice. Wait, as in like you're the MC of the night? Yes, but they spelled it E M C E E, so I see. it was like someone's name. I see. Okay. And but but yeah, man, I had lines and everything. I like I there was a there's a part where um, guy uh, is playing in a bar, and I'm the one what introduces him, and and I like I got to I got to work on the Irish accent and like make it really real and earthy and nice. everything and. I had two lines, so I didn't have to do it, but I got to engage that part of my brain yeah. where it's just like, oh, this is so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, like when you're, when you're performing on stage with that, it, it really is a sort of perfect 
crystallization, right? Of like, because you're using the technical ability you've acquired as a musician, the performative ability that you've acquired in theatrical performance, mm -hmm. and it creates this sort of magical third thing, which is all of it. Yeah. And and it's, it is it is more than the sum of its parts, I think. Like, there's a reason, because for a little while there, I was really, really looking into being an actor-musician, because for some reason, they pay them so much more. And I think that reason is it's incredibly skilled, specialized labor. I've auditioned for things before, like commercials, where uh, it pays pretty well because they're like, well, we need a drummer who can actually play drums. It's right. not just acting. Sure. like for it, And it'll literally be like, oh, well, you're not really going to be playing drums. You're standing in the corner. Uh, play, it's like a, it'll be like, I think the one I'm thinking of it was a commercial for like where it's supposed to be like a coffee lounge mm. and it's like a little jazz band in the corner. So it's literally, they just want someone who knew how to hold the sticks. So they looked like they knew what they were doing. But, uh, and you probably be on screen, screen for like two seconds, but it's like you get paid hundreds of dollars more because yeah. of that skill. Mm. So, well, I mean, you know, something else that I was kind of thinking of too is like when I was out in Colorado, because I was in a pit there and like the, not to, not to sort of out, ourselves but the pit musicians got paid incredibly well like <laughs> yeah much much better than the actors on stage which kind of blew my mind for a second but then i sort of realized well again it's specialized labor and you know it was also still not enough to live in colorado yeah like it's 25 cents a breath out there <laughs> and like that that adds up and I like you know people ask me like oh wow I can't believe you came back like wow did you have the best time and it's like yes I did I came back with $35 in my checking account and 150 bucks in my savings account yeah and like I had been making very decent money leasing apartments like mm -hmm. more than enough I have pretty expensive insurance so like more than enough to keep that paid every month and to keep myself in groceries and whatever else I wanted to if I wanted to go a show or something like that yeah and then I go out to Colorado and suddenly it's like, oh, let me pinch that penny. Oh, let me pinch that. Oh, no, I am hemorrhaging money. So does it, uh, well, actually, let me bring that up then because we've been talking about this for a while. We were talking about money and privilege and all that. Yeah. I met some people in Atlanta or kind of like started following on Instagram some, some actresses or actors in Atlanta mm -hmm. who you could tell just had like rich families because I'm like, oh, you don't work a day job and you are constantly taking classes and like traveling yeah. to traveling to New York for auditions and uh, in, in, or if you can afford to just like uh, constantly audition and then take like bit parts here and there and you know, you're not working a day job. So it's like, it's such privilege and it's, and it's weird. Cause I'm like, I hate that. Like being like an actor and everything is such a, that's one of the, like being a film and TV actor, you have to have money. Like you really, and being a theater actor too, but like, I think there's a lot of people who do theater acting as like, that's what they're really passionate about. And you know, but to actually pursue Acting or even I guess modeling is probably like that too. You have to have money because otherwise you just don't have the, you know. It's true of musicians too, man. Yeah. It is true of musicians too. I started to get really, uh, I went down a bad rabbit hole one time when I was like on some like uh, clickbait thing that was like bands that, you know, kind of pretty much came from money. So I, it makes you li like, when you, like the strokes are like that where yeah. they all met in like boarding school and you're like, oh, oh, so that's why you guys, you probably had everything you ever wanted. And, and, mm. and even if it wasn't everything you ever wanted, you weren't begging for like, you know, a crappy drum set for your birthday the way some people were or you, you know you weren't stressing it wasn't getting in the way of your art form which is awesome because your art that you create is important to me it is important to all of us but at the same time we have to recognize privilege when we see it and that that is i just appreciate it. like maybe it's just this i like if i meet a musician and I really like their music um, and I find out that they also work a work in a kitchen or they work as like a barber or something and they're doing that to support themselves to be able to go do that other thing. I'm like, I respect that. I automatically respect that more than someone who I find out literally just like get, you know, they don't have to worry about bills and stuff. And maybe that's like, I've had some people kind of act like, well, that's like a bias you need to kind of get over because you're going to meet. And I'm like, I think you need to get over it in terms of saying you can still enjoy that art, right. but I definitely, as like a person, I mean, uh, let's put it this way on this podcast, I'd rather have people who, you know, do work day jobs while they're trying to do other stuff because it, it makes me, you know, uh, 
I don't know. It's just a respect thing. I, I mean, just respect it so much more. It, it worked out for me because I had an off day today. Yeah. To where I was like, the 20th works really well for me because it's my off day this yeah. week. And I can come down and it, it just kind of lined up. So I, I know what you mean, man. Like it, I, I think it is a bias. Sure. Like I, I think one of the important things that critical theory and critical, I don't know, education can kind of teach you is that everything, everyone has bias. It is an integral part of the way that we interpret the world. What you have to do is acknowledge that bias and acknowledge how that bias informs your viewpoint. Yeah. And so like, I don't even know necessarily that you need to fix that bias because you've acknowledged it and you know that it affects the way that you perceive yeah. other musicians or other creators and stuff. Like, let that happen, man. Like if it if it informs a respect or something like that, sure. Well, I, I mean, I, I was a big movie buff in high school and hmm. um, uh, now I kind of like, there. I don't care. I think this, it used to be easier to be like a working class person and you become like a film director somehow. Sure. These days, it, the time it takes and especially to get recognized, you have to make like cinematic, amazing short films in order for, for a big studio to say, Oh, Hey, they, they showed what they're doing. The amount of talent there is out there where someone is such a good director and they've made the, the work, but they don't have the money to, you know, market the film and take it to every right. film festival and stuff like that. Uh, then like, that's what holds them back. And I think that that's just like, I think that's what bothers me deep down is just that, the most talented people that happens for every creative field oftentimes get overlooked because of, they don't have the resources that someone else yeah. has. So it's just, it, it, it's a, like you said, it's a bias. I mean, I don't necessarily need to get over it, but at the same time, as long as you acknowledge it, there you go. And, and like acknowledge that it, it is going to inform the way that you like, initially view people. But I think the problem with bias to sort of speak to a larger thing is when you let that, when you unthinkingly let that influence the way you treat people. Yeah. That's when you kind of start to get on shaky ground with me where it's like, I I just don't like you. I don't know why. No, you do, no, you do know why. Yeah. And 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 you you need to acknowledge why and then you can sort of continue to be human with them. Yeah. Like that's that's I think important. And like if someone creates something that's that's meaningful to you, that's important, and then suddenly you find out they're a Nazi, then like, okay, that. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It, Oopsie. <laughs> no, I think more for me, I just romanticized the struggle. Yeah, so when man, I when yeah. I find out that someone made you know this album in their home you know bedroom over the course of a year because they were constantly fighting you know all these different issues and money and stuff like that, and then they yeah. put it out. And, and, and at the end of the day, the art speaks for itself. I think I'm just saying some people can cover up being like not as creative or not as good of an artist in one way or another by just throwing money at it. And Spackling that hole yeah, with money. Yeah. And these days that's, uh, but we do live in a cool era where it's like, you know, you can not have much money and still, I mean, I think this podcast is a little bit of an example of that, that like. I, for a while, got in my head being like, well, I need to have, like, you know, all this equipment. And I was sure. like, eventually, you know, I do have a lot of equipment, but you you just kind of, uh, you figure out how to make it work within your budget. And, you know. I, I had something similar where, like, I, because, uh, you know, I was making videos, especially during 2020. I was posting a lot on Instagram and, like, doing... Yeah like personal videos of like practice vlogs and stuff. And I would have people add me on Instagram who are like, man, this is really great. Like you sound awesome. And I'm like, oh cool, thanks. I'll check out your stuff. And it is immaculately well produced. They've got phenomenal cameras and phenomenal recording software. And I'm literally in my bedroom in a trailer in Alabama, just doing what I can. Yeah. And I let it get, I let it get into my head. I let it just sort of, I don't know. I, I, I let like that poison just kind of take root and remove me from doing or remove me from showing mm -hmm. what I enjoyed. I still did it, and I still absolutely because like if I don't play music, my fingers start to itch, and I'm yeah. like, I, I gotta. I'll either tear the skin off with my teeth, or I'll play bass. Um, and like you know, I I think that can happen where like you sort of start to realize, wait a second, I'm getting way too into this, and I don't need to. I just need to hang out and rap with my friends for a yeah, little while. Yeah, yeah. Um... And it can, and with music and videography are similar in the fact that you can spend so much money on like mm. the smallest things and people look at you like you're crazy. Like I'm sure, it, usually it's pedals for, for guitar and bass where people are just like, because someone can look at like a bass guitar, especially if it's like really pretty and they sure. can go, oh, well, I, I, even if they don't know anything about it, they're like, 
I get it. It looks cool. I can or, recognize craftsmanship. But when they look at a pedal, they're just like, so you just step on this thing and it sounds different. <laughs> and then, and you know, and you're like, um, no, it's a lot more complicated than that. But uh, this, this chord leads to my soul. Like you don't. <laughs> I have the same thing happen with cameras though, where I'm like, someone's like, it's a thousand dollars for this lens. And I'm like, uh, it, it, this lens will make the image quality so much better. And they're like, uh, whatever you know I, but, i'm gonna watch this on my phone dude <laughs> yeah exactly um which it's actually funny i mean i've had to adapt a lot of my how i shoot everything uh no matter if it's a music video or podcast or what to think like well someone's gonna be watching on their phone yeah. so you know it kind of negates having to like shoot in like a really high resolution or anything because you're like it's, it's instead of being on a big screen it's gonna be like this big so by that same token i'm there and i'm recording like with my headphones and i'm hearing the buzz from my from my single coil yeah. pickups and i'm like ah ce n'est pas, it is ruined <laughs> it's like no somebody's gonna be listening to this on their phone and it, all they're gonna hear is just a faint rumble from your bass it's not like, and if it's like done through spotify it's gonna sound different and, yeah, yeah man so. like all of that like there's so it's like you have to identify what you have control over and what you can affect artistically in that space and then just release it. Yeah. And and release control. And that is so hard. It is. Uh, on the last podcast I did with Jake Witted, we talked about a lot about perfectionism. Just, uh, yeah. you know, because he was kind of saying, and I, I uh, can relate to it, not, you know, you, you get in your head too much. Like the amount of times I've had a podcast that I want to release, but I'm like, I could tweak the color and make it look a little bit better. But then I'm like, no, just, no one, a lot of people just put it on, they put it on the background. They're not like watching it. Yeah. Um, but let, let's kind of change gears for a second. Cause sure. we kind of, this has been a really nice, like uh, free flowing kind of right, conversation. Right, right. But sometimes that uh, for me, if I don't have a structure in mind, it ends up kind of going and, and I don't know. I feel like people get a little bored, but um, I was going to say, Let's go back and kind of talk about some origins of you as like a creative person. Because I just want to know where you're from originally and how for you, since you have several creative uh, fields that you work in, um, what was first? Was it music or, you know, that kind of thing? It was absolutely music. Um, so j just for, for background, I'm from rural Alabama. I grew up in this place uh, called Millerville in Kalita Valley. Uh, it's like central Alabama. Just south of bumfuck is real, man. Yeah. Like, it's, it's really, there's not much out there. The closest center of civilization is Talladega. And like, That's pretty bad. yeah. Um, you know, it's it's my home though. And yeah. like, I, I love it. That's one of the reasons why I'm still here in Alabama is because I go other places that don't have trees and I'm like, what's wrong? What's happened? Colorado was probably really strange in that way. Oklahoma made my palms sweat. Like driving <laughs> through Oklahoma, I felt like a little mouse yeah. on, a, on a desert plane underneath a hawk's gaze. I was yeah. like, I hate this. What's happening? It's strange. Um, but it was absolutely music that was first. I, uh, I took some piano lessons here and there when I was a wee lad. Um, didn't really stick with it for a number of reasons. Um, and then took a few vocal lessons here and there. Um, but really where I was uh, scholastically there, there was no music. Like there was a high school band, but they were woefully underfunded. Um, my mom, like I said, was an English teacher. And so I was always like really very, not necessarily passionate about academia, but it was just a part of my upbringing. It was a part of my family. Like I knew how to read before I went into kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, it, it's just always, my family have always been people who value education. And so I just really started to try and learn new things as quickly and as early as I could. Um, and then about when I was like uh, 10 or 11, I was actually 10. I, I turned 11 as we moved to Auburn. Uh, my mom decided to go back to school and get her PhD. Nice. And she interviewed a few places and eventually Auburn was like, yeah, you're, you're good. Come on, we'll, we'll, we'll get you going. And she did wind up getting that PhD. It took her a very long time. They're very hard to do. <laughs> I imagine. <laughs> yeah. But but she's officially Dr. Pamela Horn now. Like it's and she's she's teaching and like able to sort of utilize what she already knew about pedagogy because she's a very natural educator. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's kind of it. Is my mom was a natural educator and sort of imbued me with that love for education and a, a like a recognizance of its value. And like, once I moved to Auburn though, I suddenly realized, oh wait, I can play music in school. 
Yeah. And so I'm I'm like 11 years old, I'm in sixth grade and I'm like, I want to try band. And mom was like, okay, like, go ahead. That's that's fine. And so I auditioned for a few instruments. I wanted to be a drummer. I wanted to be a drummer so bad. Because Everybody did, but not a lot of people would have stuck it out, I feel like. It's true. Um, well, primarily the reason I wanted to be a drummer is because uh, my uncle, my uncle Rodney is a drummer. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that he was just the coolest dude. My uncle Chuck was also a musician. They were both actually music ministers up in Coleman. Yeah. And so to see them like, you know, just glorifying the Lord and getting up there and getting their hands dirty with the music, man, that was always just yeah. like, oh, cool. That That is like, that's what I want to do. And then suddenly I, they were like, well, you know, you didn't quite make the cut with percussion, but we need a tuba player. Okay, I see. So that's how you got into the low end. That is yeah. exactly how I got into nice. the low end. And I, I think that in in a, like conjunction with a number of other things has just sort of informed where the way that I listen to music now because I'm so used to tuning into the low end because like I that's just that's just where I've been. No, I understand. Yeah. Um, and so I I played tuba from sixth grade until I was a senior in high school. I, I went all the way through Auburn's band program. I don't think I knew that, that you played tuba before. Yeah, man. I marched sousaphone okay. uh, in, in the Auburn High School marching band. Uh, I uh, also, around like, uh, yeah, around when I was like 10 or 11, my mom got me a very nice acoustic guitar. It was an Alvarez, one of those 95 Alvarezes that's acoustic electric. I still have that thing. Um, and I just kind of started like plunking away. Um, my uncle also sort of gave my brother this gorgeous 1983 HM Stratocaster. And like, for those who know, that is a really neat little thing. Mm -hmm. It was like a limited run that they did in the 80s. It was the turquoise blue one. And get this, a, a, a neat little aside. We actually had a burglary. I forget what year, um, but they took all kinds of weird stuff. They took a bunch of our curtains, our shampoo, some of our other cleaning liquids. They like left this whole jewelry box full of my mom's very nice gold leaf jewelry mm. and then took that HM Strat. <laughs> and then while I was in Colorado, my brother texts me and is like, guess what? This guy went to a pawn shop in Jasper, which is up the road from where the, our house was mm -hmm. burgled, and found that HM Strat with my brother's name carved in the back. I was gonna say, how do you know it was the same one? That's crazy. He found my brother on Facebook and messaged him and was like, hey, did you have an, a turquoise blue Fender HM Strat? And my brother was like, what? That's crazy. And so like, I, I actually really need to hit that guy up because he still had it. He was he was trying to get rid of it and was like, don't worry, I'll, I'll hang on to it just because like, you, you guys should have this back. Yeah. And, um, but so that, that also sort of informed, I had that. And so I was like plonking away on guitar and I like had made a couple of friends, um, at, at, uh, middle school who also played guitar. And so I was like jamming along with them and like, I, I enjoyed playing guitar. It was fun. And then a friend of mine brought his bass over and left it at my house. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll just pick up bass and oh, oh, this is it. This is absolutely yeah. it. I just, I, it, it. It clicked with the tuba and it clicked with like a part of my brain that I had already started to develop. And so like when I was about 11, 12 years old, I just picked up a bass and never put it down. Like I literally did not take it back to my friend's house. Nice. Like I did not let him come back and get it. And <laughs> that that bass is actually still sort of in the mix. Um, a friend of mine who was a luthier um, made some adjustments to it. And I figured, you know, Locke's Law, he improved it so much. I'll, I let him keep it. Um, but he still posts pictures of it sometimes, like, is my baby Bronco, is one of my first projects. Nice. It's, like, so cool. Um, and then I think around about seventh grade was when I got into theater. Mm -hmm. So it's always been, like, convergent evolution. Yeah. Where, like, I, um, I think my first show was Annie, Annie Jr., I, it was, Were you Annie with the red hair? <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately. No gender bending quite yet. I was about to say, that would be an interesting Annie, though. It where, would. Uh, Arnold. Oh, if, you switch, if you switch all of the, the gender of everyone. <laughs> Mama, Mama Warbucks. Yeah, no, really, that would actually be pretty, but still, but still shaved head. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh man. Um, but yeah, like I, I, I did Annie. It was a very small role. And then uh, we did Into the Woods Junior and I was Cinderella's Prince. And then uh, I think that, so actually wait, that was sixth grade. That was sixth grade when I did that, Drake Middle School. Um, and then seventh grade, they did the Music Man Junior, Meredith Wilson's Music Man, and I auditioned and they cast me as Harold Hill himself. Nice. And I think that was when I first got the the applause bug. Because like, <laughs> I came out at the end and everyone like, you know, whistled and cheered. Yeah. And I like remember, th I remember like feeling my pupils dilate and thinking like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the good stuff. Um, and then, yeah, sort of didn't really do much uh, with theater in junior high because it was really more about band. I had a band director, Larry Cornelius, man, I, I loved that guy. And he really did a lot with sort of like, uh, well, let's let's try sort of incorporating some other instruments. I tried baritone for a little while. Mm -hmm. I tried French horn, which, oh my Lord, French horn is hard to play. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, but then I, uh, I, I auditioned for jazz band and was was on bass and he literally told me like the 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 minute i auditioned he was like yeah you're you're in like you you need to you need to continue this this is obviously something you're passionate about and you can play bass mm -hmm. already um and so that i think really got me into that sort of line of thinking i got really sort of into like sort of how how do i operate in musical settings like that mm -hmm. like it it sort of started me on this kind of thinking about larger mixes um obviously i didn't know that at the time because i was a kid <laughs> but um I, I think looking back on it now that's really where i got a lot of my love for the collaborative process of music where it's like I, and i think mr c did a really good job of that of sort of saying like okay um here we are in in this situation how could we do this differently? Are we feeling this? Like, do we want to maybe accent something differently? Or do we want to like, I don't know, let someone take a solo here instead of playing this solely? Because like our saxophone section isn't really quite up to the job, but mm -hmm. this one saxophone player can rip it. So why don't we just let him like yeah. play it and rip it? And I got this idea of the fluid nature of the give and take. And then just like kept chasing that into high school and everything. And you know, was always in concert band and um, jazz band. And then about that time, I uh, got approached by the choir director who had come to a jazz band show and was like, hey, our show choir band really needs a bassist. Um, come on, come, mm -hmm. come on over here, come on over here. We'll, we'll, we'll just sort of take your time. And then suddenly I was in marching band, honors band, jazz band, show choir band. <sighs> yeah. And, and so suddenly it was just music, 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 yeah. music. And I, it was like effortless. Mm -hmm. I literally was just like, oh, this is what I am designed as a person to do. Yeah. This is, this is what comes so naturally. This is what feels good. But also this is what I can be recognized as being good at. Yeah. And boy, that's infectious. Boy, that's like, once you get that. Woo. I'll shift gears a little bit. This sure. is something I, I wanted to talk about on here. Um, uh, I recently got a little nostalgic because I was like watching some videos from, uh, you know, I guess the past five years that my friends, like music videos that my friends have made and everything. Mm -hmm. And I watched the Bobby Rock and Roll Ghost Controller video and it made me so happy because I just hadn't watched it in a while. And I was like, the moment at the end where you guys, where you and Cole pop out of the ghost costumes, it's so great because, <laughs> especially with the way Cole like jumps. Does he jump on you or on Nate? I think. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, uh, well, there's there's like that last part is so chaotic. Like there's that yeah. one spot where he just literally like jumps into frame, just like launches himself. But like y'all, it, it didn't seem. I mean, obviously it was over the top, but it didn't seem fake. Like y'all seemed like you actually really enjoyed hanging out as a band. I miss them fellas, man. Like Nate, when he moved to California, I was like. Because, you know, he moved to Nashville and then came back to Auburn yeah. and then he moved somewhere else and came back to Auburn. And I was like, I, I really hope you do well, but also I want you to come back. I miss you. <laughs> and it sucks. Like, I originally wanted to move to California so bad um, when I was, you know, uh, getting out of high school. But then now I'm so happy I never did because, like, yeah. you you end up missing so much just because it's hard for it's hard to uproot your life that much. Mm. I mean, it, it's it's a complete change. I, uh, I had a, a lady friend who I was dating at the tail end of college who wound up taking an amazing job out there. And I was like so in love with her. 
and I was like getting my real estate license. I had looked up how to get my reciprocal license in California. And then she dumped me over Zoom in the <sighs> middle of a pandemic. And, <laughs> but in a way- No offense, but I don't, not, nothing personal. I don't blame her for the fact that like the pandemic was the time when everyone was like, do I really, what, what's going on in my life? You I know? Really, yeah. And and it it did, I don't, I, no ill will, man. She, yeah. she really did what she needed to do. And it seems like she's really happy out there. I guess, I don't know. I haven't really kept up with her much. Um, but at the same time, I'm really glad that she did that mm-hmm. because it's like me going out to Colorado and suddenly realizing, oh sure, yeah, this place is great and it's beautiful and it exists but this is my home yeah this is this is where i feel not just at peace but i feel myself i feel linked in with this identity this community this like there is there is a challenging thing to being a southerner to where it's like you go other places and suddenly people are like oh you talk funny uh and you, you don't realize it either. No, like, no, no. Like I, I always grew up being, especially in the, if you're a theater person in the South, you go, I don't want that accent. I'm yeah. going to get a whiz far away from it, but then you still I'm, use it. I'm not from the South, but then you sort of, sort of relax and you're like, what are y'all talking yeah. about? It's like, ah, oh, crap. Or like just the, the assumption of identity, right? Where it's like, oh, you're from the South. You must really like NASCAR and racism and fried chicken. And it's like, well, I like fried chicken, but the other two, mm, yeah, it, it, I, I think it, it, it's a lot more nuanced than people give it credit for. Yes. And something that is awful uh, is I think it's so racist whenever um, people from like California or New York uh, want to shit talk like Alabama or Georgia when they're like, they elected this like Republican dude. And, and then I'm like, you guys do realize there's something called gerrymandering. Mm. You guys do realize mm. there's something called like, like in Alabama specifically, I mean, there's so many reasons, mainly just uh, driver's license offices not really being open in the the most black populated part of mm. the state. So it's like things like that. And they slowly lead to, you know, like it, 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 all I'm saying is Alabama and Georgia are two of the states that are probably the most suppressed in the South in terms of like who the people we elect are not the people that we actually want. Mm-mm. You know, there, there is absolutely evidence that certain elements of both the right wing and the left wing mm-hmm. have strategically utterly oppressed access to voting for black people, other minorities, poor people. Yeah. Because how many poll places do you know that are open nine to five when other people are gonna be working? Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, there there are other things like, um, I, I understand that Georgia, I think, I think it was Georgia, it was, it might have been somewhere else. Um, they, they did away with early Sunday voting, which, yeah utterly decimated the souls to the polls mm-hmm. movement or like not even a movement it was just a community yeah. thing that they did together and they literally saw that and were like well that's gonna make our candidate not perform just shoot that down but like uh um someone who i used to really like but i have a hard time with them because of some of the stuff that you know there was the uh, the heartbeat bill in georgia uh mm. from a couple years ago uh, that brian kemp was trying to is an abortion bill right and, and uh they're okay do you know who mark duplass and his brother they're like they're they're independent filmmakers but you might recognize mark duplass is also an actor he was in um the league he was one of the main guys in that tv show oh okay uh, he, he plays pete in the league he he, he yes. uh He's the main guy in the movie Creep, which is like a movie he made that's like a horror movie. Like his whole thing for years that I respected him and his brother, they're really big on ind- in- independent filmmaking. They're like encouraging young filmmakers like, hey, no matter how much money you have, like use your iPhone, go make like a movie. We did it, you know? That's great. And they're awesome in that way. They're really supportive of like small indie filmmakers. But then um, whenever the heartbeat bill happened, he was very, very vocal all over social media being like, we should not film any, we shouldn't give any more money to Georgia. We shouldn't film anything there uh, until they do away with this. It was his way of trying to say, take it, take the filming away from them. But, but, but the response from a lot of people was, hey, the main people affected by taking filming out of Georgia would be the, the workers who make like 20 bucks an hour, basically yeah. like on set. And those people uprooted their lives coming from LA or wherever to move to Atlanta because it was an affordable place to live for the kind of work compared to like LA or New York or wherever. And now all you're doing is hurting the little man. Like you're hurting the working class guy that makes the movies. You're hurting the lighting technicians, your gaffers, your best boys, like all exactly, the, yeah. oof, man. So, so like stuff like that bothers me because you just kind of go like it, 
so anyway, on, on the podcast, I try to only have people on who are from the South. Like I've nice. never had, I don't think I've ever had some, I mean, it would make sense considering that I'm, you know, I think the, the closest we've had was having someone on who was born in New York, but has lived in the South their whole life. So I'm yeah. like, that, that doesn't count. Um, I think it's, it's the same energy. Like to go back to what you were saying, where someone over in California is like, oh, you're from Alabama. I'm so sorry. It's the same energy that I get when I tell people that I'm a Pisces, where they're like, oh no, you're a Pisces. I'm so sorry. It's like, what the fuck does that mean? Like, come on. Like there is so much more to me as a person than that one thing. And there is so much more to being a Southerner. I feel like astrology, we were talking about this with someone recently. Astrology can get very uh, um, into like eugenics basically, because you're just like, well. Eugenics of the sky. Yeah, well, you're basically just saying like, you're not you're not a good person because of when you were born. It's like, oh my God, that's kind of shitty. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's like really shitty. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, I guess, uh, kind of going back for a second, you mm. know, we talked about a lot of things just now, but, um, I kind of, uh, I, it, I never lived in Birmingham in Southside or anything where all the, did you, you did though for a while, right? A little like, while, yeah. you, did, I mean, did you enjoy your time there at least for the fact that it seemed like that was a pretty tight knit group of people all making music at all the same time? Absolutely, freaking lutely man. Like there was a real sense of community not only just at the shows but also just like i'd be walking around and i would see a friend and it would just be like oh hey man how you doing and we'd stop and talk and have that element of like southern neighborly yeah contact that i haven't really been able to experience anywhere else um and like you know, I I lived I lived in Southside briefly. I also lived over in Highlands, and like it's really interesting, like living in a place like Highland Park because you start to see the sort of other side of Southern neighborliness, which is nothing. Yeah, it's like this insular quality of like they're super rich, they're super like you know again insular, like don't really want to associate with the rabble. But then you know you find people who sort of like skirt that line and are like these people who are worth tens of millions of dollars have a really nice house in Highlands but come to firehouse shows. And yeah, that's kind of one of the things I love about Birmingham yeah. is there's this mixing of the salt and the sugar and it it all just kind of comes together to make this really weird just kind of melange of like wealth and privilege with like just barely scraping by and like punk punching, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, and something I kind of noticed, like Birmingham is an interesting city in terms of uh, music wise. I've noticed that it's like, there's not really, I wouldn't say that there's like one like identity for Birmingham other than like, I've never, I don't hear a lot of music that I would describe as like, melodic and clean it's like it seems like there's a lot there's everything has at least a little bit of a twinge of like a heaviness to it not like metal heaviness but like yeah it, a little bit of a punkness to it or a little bit of something that's like alternative you know well even still there are bands like uh rude and true mm -hmm. who are literally a folk duo yeah like there's there's a really strong folk scene i'm like i'm sure wilk would be able to to corroborate this like yep. people who go to little italy and do like they have jazz nights at Little Italy, but they also have folk nights and bluegrass nights. Yep. And like there's there's really like you think about places like uh, like, uh, you know, Detroit with Motown or like Chicago with uh, like all the things that they did or like Nashville, even mm -hmm. with like that Nashville sound. Birmingham yeah. doesn't have that. Like no, Birmingham yeah. is such an eclectic mix of everything. Like, sure, there is a thriving punk scene and it is probably one of the strongest voices in the city. But there's also a very strong country thing. I'm thinking here of Daniel Bowden, mm -hmm. who I think you also yeah. know. Um, he is part of a very thriving singer, songwriter, country bent folk scene. Um, there's like this crazy vibrant Latin rap scene in Birmingham really? that I have no access to. I have no idea how. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. There's a friend of my brother's who ran a label, uh, Lobotomix, who like put on a lot of shows for like up and coming hip hop artists who are in Birmingham, and that that stuff is everywhere, man. Wow. Like hmm. there's there's a really really strong vibrant scene of that there, and um, there's also like people who kind of mix that. Like there was a client of mine whose name just went. Um, but he was on me cause he like heard some stuff that I was doing with bicycle day, heard how heavy we were getting and was like, dude, I'm trying to work on this one project called solstice X. That's like heavy metal rap. 
Nice. And okay. he's like, nothing like Limp Biscuit. None of that shit. Like, yeah. We want to go hard and we want to like black the eyes of people who look down on us and just like, and I was like, dude, yes, <laughs> let's go. That sounds like so much fun. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I guess I need to hit him up. I'm not really sure. I know he's doing shows because I like see him posting about stuff. Um, there's another guy. His Instagram handle is Donnie Say Go. Um, he, ah, man, he's about to release some stuff that I think is going to really, really be interesting. He's working with another rapper whose name went, and, but like, again, there's just something for everybody in Birmingham. Yeah. Like, if, if you're willing to dig for it, there is going to be something happening. You kind of answered it already, but do you have any other, like, uh, one thing I, I really want to do on the podcast uh, is like, give local shout outs to like music that... It can be, I mean, I think from the South in general, is there something from like Atlanta or Birmingham or Nashville or anywhere? Is there like a band that you've been listening to that you kind of like, hey, more people need to know about this? I'm trying to think of, because I had a couple that I gave on the last podcast. I'm trying to think of other people that I could maybe like suggest for people to listen to. There's a lot. There's there's a band that we shared a bill with, uh, Bicycle Day. Um, they're called Vampire Mansion. Okay, I haven't heard of them. They're a lot of fun. They put out a uh, uh, an EP. It's sort of shoegazy, moody, kind of goth rock, but still fun and bouncy and playful. Um, there's another one... Um, Oh gosh, uh, SCP and I went to see them when they opened for. Um, oh man, I'm completely forgetting it. I'll 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 text you. If I you can want, uh, I can interrupt with a couple. So like th- this sure. is not uh, this is actually <sighs> Florida is a weird one because they're like they are the South and they, they parts of it especially. Yeah. But uh, but it's like not you know. But the, one of my favorite like I guess more independent um, musicians I've listened to over the past several years is a a psychedelic artist by the name Timothy Erie, which is a great name. Uh, Have you heard of Timothy Erie? I have. Timothy Erie is one of my favorites. Uh, I've met him a couple times. Um, It's really, it's mainly one guy and he kind of has like other musicians around him and everything, but Mm -hmm. um, I like it because his music, he's out of Orlando, I believe. His music is a a really good like throwback vintage kind of psychedelic sound. Um, I mean, it's got like a little bit of a modern twist to it, but for the most part, it's very like 60s, just kind of like washed in like a, cool. a vintage sound um, and very effects heavy. Like I, I like it a lot. Um, that's He's probably one of my favorites. And then I would also say, I don't think this band is around anymore. I don't think mm. they're making music anymore. But another, I would say they're kind of like more like an indie psychedelic kind of sound is okay. um, uh, Calico Vision. They were from Athens. Um they uh they've actually got hold on for both of these actually we've got like a calico vision uh cassette oh that's rad yeah where i mean and it's supposed to be like a play on calico vision so i mean like that's uh actually this is timothy erie his ritual cd oh, but, or his ritual wow. cassette great cover i know but uh those are a couple of my favorite like local um you know, and then actually, since we're looking at my cassettes, I only really have local <laughs> yeah, cassettes. Sweet. Man. Uh, another one, they they actually don't make music anymore, but you know Jackson and the bouquet. The bouquet. This was a great visit. Birmingham based. They're not together anymore, but right. they're great. They are great. Oh man, and Abby too. Ugh. Oh, yeah, dude. It, I man, I love playing. I music forgot that with Abby. I Pants. forgot that was she in Bobby Rock and Roll at the same she time as you? She was. Yeah. I like. There's. There's sort of like I like to think of it in like the Wikipedia. You know how they do their little line grabs. Yeah. Her line sort of. She started with Nate and then like slightly intersected with mine and then Cole kind of took over. Yeah. But man, she is such a good drummer. Yeah. Yeah. I it, we were went over to Jackson's for his birthday the other night and she like pops in and I'm like on bass and she just sort of like, oh, hey, let me hop in on them boom baps. And she is still, she like started with sort of like, I don't really get to drum much, but yeah. uh, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, no, I so, love it. Yeah. She's so good, man. Um, one more, uh, this is a little bit older one from a few years ago. Uh, hmm. Ha Ha Mart. It's a, uh, no idea. So, Drew is the guy who does Haha ha Mart. He um was he's from Birmingham. He was based there for a long time. I think he's based in Brooklyn now. Okay. Um, but Haha ha Mart is almost exactly what you'd think it is. It is 
grocery store music. Incredible. So it's 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 an instrumental album that you can find everywhere. But like I bought it on cassette a few years ago because I had a cassette player in my car, and yeah. it was the perfect cassette player music that you just like put it in your and it's just like ding 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 ding. It's very groovy and like so. Those are like my local, you know. That I I know I just picked them up off the shelf, but sure. those are like the ones. Have you thought of anyone else? It's fine. Yeah, a, a couple actually. Um, C and Rolf reminded me uh, Phantom Limb. Them boys. I suggested Ooh. I suggested Pastoral on the last one because I love that album. Yes, it's really good. Great album, and also just like they're like a really good band to go see live. Yeah. I always appreciate a band who put a lot of effort into their live shows, not necessarily through theming or anything, but just from raw energy that they yeah. put out. And like they're always like every single one of them boys can throw it down musically, and also like bring an energy to their performances that is just really infectious yeah. and, and it really means a lot. Um, another guy that I thought of, I actually bumped into him just the other day, but I'm I'm really like excited to sort of see how Birmingham accepts his music because I think it's a little out of the sort of normal singer songwriter bubble, but Chandler Austin Jones. I he yeah I I know him yeah he, he, he used to be in Auburn I think he did yeah. he did um I I met him through a, a mutual friend and just kind of thought at first like oh okay he's just sort of another singer songwriter that are dotted along the trees down Main Street but then I sort of <laughs> actually listened to his music and the sort of morose nature the really like. I don't know. There's a very intellectual sadness to what he does that I find very, I don't know, engaging. Mm -hmm. And and I, I think he would also probably be a good one to have on the cast, honestly, yeah. because he, he obviously sort of sees the world in a very interesting lens. Um, and he's trying to do a lot of shows uh, when uh, when this comes out next year, um, <laughs> <laughs> as in 2023. Oh wow, yeah, you're uh, blowing my mind there, but you're right. I know, yeah. Oh, yeah. Happy New Year. <laughs> yeah, but there's there's them, and then um, there's another. Oh, there's another one. Um, it's uh, he used to go by uh, the Devil and Daniel Webster, but I think they're like Webster's Wheel now. Yeah, uh, I went to high school with Daniel, and he's um, uh, I saw him. Uh, he wasn't playing his music, but he was performing with someone else, and like, yeah, he's still I doing think stuff. That's his partner, right? Like, he's is that? Are they? Yeah, yeah, but he was actually performing with a larger. And both of oh, them okay. were singing with a group of people that were singing uh, Christmas songs. So nice. it was like, yeah. I, I find that 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 sort of partnership in in creation always really interesting. And, oh, same. And like I'm I'm definitely keeping an eye on. So I think they actually just announced a tour, which I'm super stoked for. I hope that really treats them well. Like I just I'm always interested in that that dynamic. Yeah. Where, like it's clear that they're influencing each other and and like sort of uplifting each other's art. And like speaking as someone now who has a really artistic partner who. She's not even a musician, but just being near her, she's so creative and so freeing. Like she just her very presence uplifts me nice. and, and lets me be more creative. And so like to see that and like also my partner wants to start learning banjo. And nice. I'm just like, let's freaking go. Family that, band. That would be fun. That would be really that's a cool instrument to learn too. Yeah. I mean, she's she's just always been obsessed with banjo. That's one of the reasons we went to see Bela Fleck is she just she loves the sound of it. She loves just sort of what it adds to music. And yeah. I, I'm with her, man. It's it's a great instrument. But yeah, I, I think that's probably about most of the the local bands that I can think of. And I'm sure there's more. It's oh, just like sure. like off the top of your head. I just like to do that because the whole point of this podcast is to shine a light, give a little bit of like a look behind some local musicians who. They're not going to be featured on uh, a big, a huge podcast or anything, but I feel like people deserve to know your story. They deserve to know, you know, and all it takes is uh, when you don't have, when you don't have the money and resources that like being on like some major label sure. uh, gives you, it's word of mouth. And so right. stuff like this is a good way for me to learn music and, you know, it's, it's fun. Also... How funny would it be is if, if like, you know, suddenly Phantom Limb like that just blow up and then we're like, oh, look, they mentioned him on yeah. this podcast. Yeah, yeah, oh. I know what you mean. <laughs> um, oh, is there anything that you want to promote? Because I think we're probably going to wrap the conversation up cool. soon. But uh, uh, is there anything like 
new music coming out or anything like that that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, man. Bicycle Day is working on an EP right now. Hopefully have it out top of 23 sometime January, February. And uh, yeah, we've already got some music out on Spotify. If you want to check that out, um, we're definitely changing direction. Um, I think something that's really interesting about Seth as a songwriter is that he's willing to take music that is already there and sort of change it slightly and and we're we're planning on releasing uh <laughs> what we're sort of referring to as the shoegaze ep where like we take these songs that we've made very like and make them more like languid and chilled out and yeah. stretched out and like bigger <laughs> bigger sound with more effects and like just more shoegazy yeah um so there's that um i know brother josh is going to be releasing music um he is trying to organize a tour sometime in april so we're hoping to be on the road around then. And um, yeah, man, I mean, I'm I'm saving up some money right now to like put out my own music. I have what I like to call the pandemic reservoir of like over a hundred songs that I've got in yeah. here and in here. Nice, yeah. That I'm hopefully going to be releasing next year just because like I've got, as it is, I've got two EPs and four studio albums that I could put out. So it's a good feeling in a way, though. It is. I'm I'm excited. I'm glad that it's in a concrete form so that I don't have to retain it all because, boy, that'd be a lot. And I would love to just pull a King Gizzard, man, and just like, bam, 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 bam. Like, keep they they blow my mind. And one thing that really blew my mind, uh, I saw them uh, back in October <sighs> in Atlanta. It, it was amazing. They were they released multiple albums that month yep. and they were on tour for months before that. So I was like, they literally recorded this probably like a year ago and yep. knew that they were going to be releasing it while they were on tour. Yep. It's amazing and crazy. I don't know how they put out that much stuff. And it's all good. It's, it's like, all good. I mean, it's not every second on every track is sure, wonderful, sure. but it's like, it's not bad. It's, it's not like some... And, and, and you have some rappers that do that same kind of thing and half of it's shit, but you know, it, you know. I like, I listened to, to Changes recently because I it's like, great. I heard that like, oh, A&F Sharp, mm, are we, are we sure about that, Giz Boys? And yes, yes, they were sure and it worked. Well, I think they weren't <laughs> sure until they heard it and they were like, it's actually really cool. It works, yeah. <laughs> it, changes is cool to me because it's such, it's a lot groovier than, uh, it's a lot more like, sounds like a 70s kind of like, proggy not proggy but it's it's definitely groovier than their other stuff and i think they do such interesting things with tonality and sort of understanding that like a major seven chord is going to resolve differently when it's paired next to like a diminished chord versus like you know what uh like hate dancing which is just like that same kind of back and forth but I I, I don't know, man. Like, we could probably do a whole app on Giz, man. I, I I think I could. I'll, I probably will at some point have someone on or a couple people on to do, like, a ranking of albums or oh, something. Would, yeah, that would be There's so too many. Fun. I mean, they have over 20 now, so uh, it's it's hard. But anyway, uh, thank you for, you know, uh, coming on. Yeah, um, I'll just dude. do a couple plugs real quick. Uh, <laughs> follow us on YouTube. Follow uh, or subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram and uh, TikTok at Psychoactivision. Um, smash that like button. Yeah, thumb smash that subscribe. like and subscribe. No, I mean, really, I, I do like when people, no one's really ever done this, but like, I want people to comment and let us know musicians that we should have on. Like, there's probably people I've never heard of that deserve a chance to come on and talk, but you know, just don't. Anyway, um, but yeah, unless you, do you have anything else you wanted to, you know? Oh, man, I don't know. Just be good people. <laughs> <laughs> the, like, go out and, and be human with each other. Just, there you go. You know? Recognize bias, let yourself be yourself, and, and treat people with respect. That's and all have I'm fun. To do. Have fun. There you yeah. go. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for coming on. It's been awesome. Appreciate you, man. Of course.